When you enter a middle game position, it isn't always easy to know what to do when there aren't any obvious tactics or targets to attack. How do you figure out what side of the board you should be playing on and what your plan should be? Knowing typical middle game pawn structures and what common plans are used in these structures can be a great help. Let's look at some examples of how pawns in the middle game help us figure out what to do. In this position, future world champion Jose Raul Capablanca has the black pieces against American master Frank Marshall. Notice white has four pawns on the king side against black's three pawns. This is known as a four versus three pawn majority on the king side. Black, on the other hand, has three pawns on the queen side, and white only has two pawns. Black has a three versus two pawn majority on the queen side. Since white's pawn majority is on the same side as his castled king, it isn't easy for white to advance these pawns without risking his king's safety. In an endgame, black's king will also be a good defender against these pawns if they advance. Looking at the queen side, black comes up with the plan of advancing his queen side majority, starting with the move b5. White tries to slow down black's queenside pawn advance with a3. Black grabs more space in white's territory with the move c4. Black's plan is to continue to advance the queenside majority with a5 and b4, grabbing more space in white's territory. One long-term plan for black is to use the queenside pawn majority to create a pass pawn, which was the winning plan in the game. Let's see how he did it. Capablanca has made a lot of progress with his queenside majority, but he still needs to create a pass pawn. Black is now threatening rook c2, since white cannot capture the rook, when black would recapture with the b3 pawn and promote it into a queen on the next turn. Marshall prevented this idea by playing bishop d1. It looks like white is holding everything together against the queenside pawn majority, but now black breaks through white's defenses with c3. After b takes c3, can you find Capablanca's idea? That's right, he played b2. Black was able to force a pass pawn by advancing his pawn majority, and White's rook cannot both capture the pass pawn and protect the bishop on d1. After rook takes b2, and rook takes d1, Capablanca's great pawn play resulted in being up a bishop for two pawns, an advantage the great master had no trouble converting into victory. Let's take a look at another example of using pawns in the middle game to gain the upper hand against your opponent. You don't always need a majority of pawns to attack. In this typical queen's gambit decline position, white has three pawns on the queen side against black's four pawns. Even though black has the pawn majority on the queen side, white can successfully attack on that side of the board using an idea called the minority attack. After b4, White's idea is to attack the c6 pawn and create a weakness. If black tries to block the minority attack with b5, notice black's pawn on c6 is now unprotected and will be a long-term target along the c-file. If black tries to protect the b5 square with a6, after a4, knight f8, and b5, the minority attack crashes through. After a takes b5, and a takes b5. If black captures the b-pawn with c takes b5, black now has a weak, isolated d-pawn, and after bishop takes b5, bishop d7, black loses the d-pawn after the simple bishop takes f6, with knight takes d5 to follow. If black advances the c-pawn with c5, white plays d takes c5, capturing a pawn, in isolating black's d-pawn. If black tries to regain the pawn with bishop takes c5, black's position crumbles after bishop takes f6. The queen cannot capture the bishop without losing the d5 pawn, and after g takes f6, black's kingside structure is ruined, and white will begin to put pressure on the weak d5 pawn with moves such as rook f to d1. Finally, if black doesn't move the c-pawn and makes a developing move such as knight g6, white's minority attack succeeds in creating a weakness after b takes c6 and b takes c6. Black has a weak pawn on c6 that will be put under heavy pressure on the c-file and will be a long-term weakness for black to defend. Let's take a look at one more example together. 
Can pawns help us create a plan even when there isn't a pawn majority or minority attack available? Yes, they can. In this position, with black to move, all of black's pieces except the rook on a8 are ready for action on the king side. The problem is, there aren't a lot of open lines on the king side. Can you find a way to change the pawn structure to open up lines against white's king side? If you found f4, great job. Black attacks white's knight and g3 pawn. If white retreats the knight, black will simply win a pawn after f takes g3. After g takes f4, bishop takes f4. With a single trade of pawns, a lot has changed in black's favor. Black's light squared bishop has been activated, adding pressure to white's newly isolated pawn on h3. Black's dark squared bishop now controls the opened h2 to b8 diagonal, pointing directly at white's king. Now that there isn't a pawn on f5 for black, black's rook on f8 will enjoy open lines on the f-file once black moves the knight. White's weakened kingside and passive pieces will be no match for black's energetic pieces, ready to join forces and attack the white king. Now that you've learned how understanding pawn structures can help direct you where to play, let's put your skills to the test.